You're listening to Radio Maria, a Catholic voice in your home. We now present our program, Vigilant Heart, with your host, Father Michael Sliney. Okay, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Holy Spirit, we ask you to bless this interview I'm going to be having tonight with Brian, Brian and Taylor Rabbit, that it can be effective, inspirational, and helpful for all of our listeners, for them as well. We ask you to bless all of our listeners around the visual of the Queenship of Mary, that the Blessed Mother can accompany them, be very close to their hearts, and help them in their journey. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good. I think I've told all of you that I've been trying to focus my radio show on young people, and I've known the Rabbit family for many years. We started a leadership training program in Annapolis in Sherwood Forest back in the day. So I knew Ryan and Taylor when they were still in grade school, very young, young guys, very innocent, happy kids are still innocent and happy. And I thought it'd be great to have them on to talk about their journey as brothers, journey in the faith, their journey through the struggles they've had in life. So welcome, Ryan and Taylor. Great to have you on. Thank you, Father Michael. We're excited to be here. Good. Yeah, thanks Good. for having us on. We're excited to tell you a little bit about our lives and our faith and things like that. Great. Well, you guys have uh, two sisters and obviously you're two brothers and I've always been struck how close you are as brothers you know it doesn't always happen that brothers get along sisters get along and I've always noticed along the way that you've been truly friends and you have each other's back you have a great esteem for each other so if both of you could describe your relationship as brothers what you admire about each other and what particular stories would highlight your deep friendship yeah absolutely <clears throat> You know, I can start off, um, you know, Taylor's my best friend. Um, when it really boils down to it, you know, he, he's been there for me um, ever since we were growing up. We're, we're six years apart, but um, we might as well be a year or two apart. And in some ways, he might even be my older brother. Um, not all, in all ways, uh, but, you know, we've been really blessed. I would say me personally, um, getting to grow up with Taylor. Um, you know, we get along, we're, we're different personalities, but, um, I think we've got a really good, honest relationship with each other where we try and challenge each other and we, um, have a, have a deep connection where, you know, we can talk about things that we're struggling with in life and we can hold e each other accountable and, and, and challenge each other. Um, you know, one, one thing that happened to me, we can allude to this later, uh, a more recent story was I had gotten in a, a water skiing accident um, that, you know, disabled me in a lot of ways where I couldn't work for uh, six months. It took me a full year to recover. Um, and Taylor was my, you know, personal cheerleader. I was having trouble, you know, just walking around and, you know, I couldn't even read a morning newsletter. Um, and I was in some dark places and, and he was there when I needed him most. Um, and he's he's been like that for me my whole life. So... You know, I've just been blessed to um, have a brother and have a brother like Taylor. That's great. Yeah. And uh, or, go ahead, Father Michael. No, um, I think that's it's nice to have a story, too. Thanks for sharing, Ryan, because one thing is, is like in theory, but he actually gave up his time and energy to be with you. And that's love. Love is sacrificing your space, your time to be with a person who needs you when you need it. So that's a great story. So Taylor, any comments on this topic? Yeah, definitely. So just like Ryan said, we're, uh, you know, we've been best friends since we were kids and I actually have to give credit to my mom. Uh, you know, later on, we'll talk about how we stay close to siblings, but you know, she always said like, you know, your family's your best friend. Like we love each other so much. And I think she really did a great job with that. Um, you know, one thing that bothered us as kids was we couldn't bring uh, friends on vacation, but that forced us to hang out as siblings. And, at, you know, in the time it was frustrating, but honestly, like that worked out so well because that was time when we could really just spend together as family. And I think that was really great. Um, but, you know, turning to Ryan as a brother, like if I was to go on about like all the times he'd been there for me, I'd take all the interview time uh, just going over him. But like, you know, just to mention too, uh, I mean, he literally caught me like one time when we were in a tree or I was climbing a tree to get like a toy airplane and he caught me. I could have like broken my legs. I probably would have fallen from like 15 feet. And then 
Another time, which was pretty crazy, was a shark was actually coming after me, and he used a boat and interjected it as it was coming after me, like when we were in the Keys. So not as he, not only has he been there for me, like you know, as a brother and a good guy, he's like helped me out in different situations. So I've always been able to rely on him, and uh, I've always admired how hard he works and how he you know works to improve his relationships with his family, and also is really diligent about his work and his profession. So I can't say enough good things about him. That's great. So Ryan, are you 30 now and Taylor's 24? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm 30, Taylor's 27 now, right? Yep. And yeah. He's 27, okay. And then um, what are the ages of Olivia and Alexandra? You have two, two other sisters. Yeah, we've got two other sisters. We've got two sisters, um, so boy, girl, boy, girl. Um, you know, I'm the oldest and Olivia's 29, Taylor's 27, and Allie's 25. Yeah, okay. That's great. And how, how do you how do you foster sibling unity throughout the year now that you're adults? Because you know you have a sister in Europe, sister just finished college. You guys are both working. It must be hard to get together. And what 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 type of things do you try to do so you can foster that unity? Yeah. So uh, one of the things we do is we try to do sibling calls, if not every month, like every other month. You know, we'll just touch base. We don't really systematically do it. We just like to check in with each other and that's really nice. You know, we'll do it like on a Sunday or something like that. And then pretty consistently we've done a sibling trip like every year. Um, but honestly, more than anything, I think it's that sibling call that keeps that consistency up. And we all just, you know, call each other pretty sporadically to keep up with each other. Like we don't have any schedule. We just, you know, we want to keep up with each other. So we keep doing it. But you know, I think it's just showing that intention, like caring about what's going on in their lives that keeps a really strong uh, unity, you know, between the siblings. Now, it seems like you're, you and your cousins also get together. Um, is that also a relationship you guys developed throughout the year with, with your mom, sisters, kids, and, and your different cousins? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like Taylor said, it's, it really boils down to effort. Um, so finding a way to, to make that a priority and, and make time whether that's once a month, everybody getting together and, and uh, hopping on a FaceTime or you know going on a family trip every year. Um, it's easier with our side of the family out here. Unfortunately, we're on the East Coast and a lot of my mom's family's in the Midwest. Um, but thankfully, we still get to see them, you know, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas and New Year's. And, you know, we still make an effort to have a great relationship with them. Um, you know, our parents, um, really made an effort to get us out to the Midwest and have big group to get, you know, get togethers with our cousins. So um, we're really fortunate that a lot of our cousins, I would say we even consider as additional brothers and sisters in a lot of ways. That's beautiful. So you guys spent your high school at Culver Academy in the Midwest. So if you can tell us a bit about that place and how it helped form your character and your faith. Yeah. So, um, I went there after seeing my brother go there and um, I think it gave him a lot of direction. You know, I don't want to speak too much for him, but, you know, I visited and just off one visit of the campus, I saw how focused everyone was. You know, I mean, you're, you have to march on the weekends and one day a week, you know, you have to shine your shoes, you get your room inspected. I just think it was so foundational in building habits that, you know, a lot of people don't have to deal with the discipline of doing that in high school. You know, along with going away from your parents at son, such a young age, you learn to be independent and you learn to tackle all these things at such a young age. It really helps transition when you get into college. And then you have this really strong base going into college that, you know, a lot of people are just learning how to live alone when they get out there for the first time. But they've structured it so well that you're ready to tackle all these challenges. And then it translates really well into real life after that. That's great. Any comments, Ryan, on your experience? Yeah, just, you know, like to add to it, some, some background information. Um, Culver Academy is a, a military and uh, leadership school program um, split between a boys' school and a girls' school, and the boys are affiliated with um, leadership. It's a very close to... University of Notre Dame, actually. It's about 30 minutes away from South Bend, Indiana. And I would say Culver is really based on three pillars. Um, you know, the first is 
excellence in you know developing your your mind, your learning, and I would say leadership, which is where the military aspect comes into play. And then uh, the second pillar I would say is athletics. Everybody's involved in sports. Um, even if you're not playing a sport in the off season, you're working out, you're involved in intramurals. And then the third thing is spirituality. Um, Culver was, was really great in continuing, even when I was away from home, uh, being able to develop myself personally, uh, spiritually, um, everybody went to either mass or church, or if, if you weren't Christian, um, they had other services for other, um, religions, which I think is very important, uh, that the school fosters and believes in the importance of developing yourself spiritually at such a young age. Uh, but yeah, Culver was, was incredible. Uh, I'd say it changed my life in a lot of ways. Um, many, many great relationships, um, great, great discipline at a young age. And, you know, I was so thankful for the experience. That's great. So you guys were a part of our leadership training program as kids. And then later on, you're now part of our Lumen Fellowship program here in DC. If you can tell our listeners what that is and how, how that's helped you and how spiritual coaching has helped you along the way. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll start with the spiritual coaching. Um, you know, so I'll speak with Father Michael, you know, about how my spiritual direction is going, you know, what my goals are with uh, my relationship with God and my connection to the church, you know, reflect on things I want to be doing better at and uh, my relationships in my life. You know, I'd say one of the core things there is just taking the time to really reflect and, you know, look at yourself and then getting, you know, Father Michael's opinion has been so great because all the people he interacts with that he gets to pass on some of this advice and some of his own advice. I think it's been really, really helpful for me to learn to try and craft myself in the, into the person I want to be. And Lumen has been such a great influence for me because, you know, it's an organization where I'm surrounded by all these guys that have similar values. They want to strengthen their relationship with God. They want to be leaders in their community and they all want to be a pillar in their family and, you know, really a leader uh, in their family to connect with God. So I think that's been really, really valuable for me. Like in addition to going to church and things like that, to really get to connect, not only, uh, you know, personally with these guys, you get to talk about the struggles you're dealing with, you know, with work or family or anything. And it just really helps you stay on the right path. So I'd say those things have been like paramount in my development since college and, you know, really trying to create the person I want to be instead of kind of letting life take you, you know, whatever direction you're going to end up going. That's great. Thank you, Taylor. Any comments, Ryan? Yeah, I think, you know, similar to how Culver was, I think, um, the Lumen fellowship, uh, the Lumen fellows program is, is huge. Um, it, it challenges you in your spiritual journey and it surrounds you with peers who are also being consistently challenged. So having that feedback outside of mass, in addition to coaching, I think, um, leads to greater results and also great meaningful friendships out of it. Um, I'm learning something every single time I show up to one of our Lumen circles. And there are a lot of guys that I think are really sharp and think very, very deeply um, about their faith. And, you know, every single time I walk away, um, I, I'm, I'm s certainly impacted and, um, you know, leading into spiritual coaching, it's just another rep. Um, you know, father Michael is, is like the police SWAT team out here. You know, he's, he's going in and, you know, he, he has, he has high standards, but he gives uh, great advice. And, you know, I'm just very, very grateful to have, you know, these wonderful people around me on my faith journey. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Taylor. So yep. I've gotten to know both your, your parents fairly well over the years, Cheryl and Bob. And when I think of them, I think of a very beautiful couple. I think of a beautiful marriage. I think of a, a deep faith. And I know they have a tremendous love for all of you. So if you can talk a little bit about the example they've given you and also your grandparents. I, I met your, your grandfather, Harry, and just the way he spoke of your grandmother, it sounded like they have a tremendous relationship too. And I think his formation in the Marines and 
his commitment to service, his integrity, his goodness of heart, all that must, must have had some impact on you as well. Yeah, so um, I, I'll talk a little bit about um, his wife, we call her Mimi. Um, so to start with, you know, my parents have, you know, really led by example for me. And I think that's been so impactful. Like so many people tell you what they want you to do and what you should do. But I, I think the most important thing is to just live it and, uh, and lead by example, rather than tell people how you want to live. Uh, you know, I think they've done such a great job with that. And especially my grandma, uh, through her battle with cancer, you know, I believe her battle with cancer was about 15 years. Uh, and she always relied on her faith throughout that whole period. Uh, you know, we saw her go through some really, really tough times and she never complained. She always had a smile on her face. Uh, and she was just really a light, an example of like how you should take struggle and challenges in your life. And, you know, she would always tell us, you know, she was offering it up for God. So I have, you know, a tremendous amount of respect for her. And, you know, it was really incredible to see someone deal with such a challenge like that and how important your faith can be in getting you through those tough times. And she really lived it. You know, she didn't, she preached it her whole life, but when, you know, the rubber met the road, she was doing it. I mean, she wasn't complaining at all. And, and that, you know, that was incredible to see. So she's been a really big light for our family. That's great. Ryan, any comments? Yeah. And, and you know, we've, we've been fortunate to have a lot of, a lot of great examples. Um, you know, you alluded to our grandfather, who's the origin of, of Culver um, and the Marine Corps values, uh, you know, faith was, was very important. Um, you know, they took their chi ki uh, kids to church every week. And, um, you know, I would say, uh, our, our parents, um, our mom and dad have followed in the same footsteps. Um, you know, we got a Catholic education going to St. Mary's and, um, you know, both of our parents have, have, uh, been an excellent example of, um, you know, how to foster and continue growing in their faith. Um, you know, I'd say my mom has taken up a bit of the mantle from Mimi, um, who's no longer with us, but, you know, her commitment to faith and, and the love she has for God is, is, is beautiful. And, you know, it's great to see examples of that, um, you know, in your immediate family. Yeah, that's, it's wonderful. Even the fact you guys feel comfortable spending time there at the at your home, not all millennials would hang out as much as you do. So that's a good sign. You actually love being around your family, right? So yeah, yeah. but we are still meeting virtually, so we're still millennials. <laughs> yeah, <Okay. laughs> it might be it might be because of the cooking too, right? It might have an impact on. Yes, Allie's cooking. <laughs> that's right. She's uh, she's becoming quite a chef. From what I heard. Yeah. Um, exactly. How how can the Catholic Church? better reach your generation and bring more of your friends back to the pews on Sunday. I asked that question because there's just a lot of kids that went to Catholic school that were raised in the faith. You know, they, they go to college, they get a job and it seems like they, they kind of checked out and they used to come back, but they're not coming back as much. Less are getting married in the church, less are raising their kids Catholic. So what do you think we can do to kind of curb that, that tendency? I think it's a, a great question. And I think a lot of institutions are struggling with this, with our generation, even outside of faith, I think specific to the Catholic church. Um, when it comes to getting people in their twenties and thirties, when they get out of college or, or whatever they're pursuing to continue, um, coming to church on Sundays, I think there is a huge issue in this country with, um, mental, uh, mental health issues. So anxiety, depression, et cetera. So clearly there is a void here that's not being filled and it seems to be increasing, um, in our culture. And it seems to be, uh, definitely a, like a Western and even an American issue. Uh, I think the, the church has a huge, uh, responsibility and, um, and a platform to fill that void. And I think preaching, continuing to preach a more positive and a positive message um, to 
all Catholics or people who are interested in being Catholic can really fill some of that void. So I think continuing to promote uh, a positive message, the message of love in the Catholic Church, can really fill a void that I think a lot of people um, have in their hearts today. And you know, I think it'll it'll lead to more people coming to church and and feeling more more fulfilled. Any comments so, too? Or yeah, so going off what Ryan said, like I think you know even potentially without as much of religion in American society today, that could be contributing to some of those feelings, um, which would lead it to be a great solution for a lot of people that are suffering through maybe different types of mental illness or you know things of that nature. Another thing that this is a little more technical, but I would think would be really critical is to have you know priests and like public speaking courses because you know I think that there can be so many priests that are really great at speaking and, and interacting with people and really great people, but with all the digital uh, distractions nowadays and people having such a short term attention span, like it's I feel like it's even more important to be able to get a message across quickly and effectively. And as people's attention span is con- to decline, it just makes that that much more important to be able to deliver that message and adjust to people's ability to receive that message. So I feel like that's such a critical part in being able to get, you know, people involved and really paying attention. And the last quick point I'd say is like, you know, feeling like they're part of a group. I mean, being with Lumen has made me feel like, you know, I'm part of an organization and you know, it also motivates you to keep going to church and, and like not only getting the message from church, but also from your group. So it's like all encompassing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, one, one thing you guys didn't mention, which I know you benefited from, is the outreach factor. You, you've helped out with street evangelization. You've helped out with, um, we've helped put clothes on the homeless uh, in D.C. I know, Taylor, you went out to help with that, that construction of a porch for a family that had gotten hit with cancer and had a bunch of, mm-hmm. bunch of financial issues. So what you say giving back is another way to grow in the faith as well? Definitely. Um, yeah, I mean... There's nothing more fulfilling, I'd say, than, you know, doing something like that. And then, you know, I mean, I, you know, at first I didn't even know that family, you know, had cancer. I just, you know, I felt that we were going out and trying to do something good. And then realizing, you know, hearing about the financial issues and and then the sickness on top of it. I mean, uh, it's definitely very fulfilling. And, you know, you want to be helping people people out that are struggling in times like that because, you know, not everyone's as fortunate. Uh, and, and some people just have to take on much bigger battles. Yeah, so, so that the family Taylor's referring to was, was very unique. That in one year, one of the daughters lost her leg, another daughter had brain cancer, and, and the husband had stomach cancer. He had his stomach removed, and they also all got COVID. <laughs> so, you know, obviously it had a huge impact on the family. Their porch was falling apart, they had issues with their oven. So we brought our lumen guys and fellas in and rebuilt the porch. We bought a new oven, did some work around the house, but they were so grateful. And yeah, that, that was, it also makes you realize, you know, just the gift of health. And on that note, Taylor, you're about to do a half Ironman coming up, right? Just a few weeks. So if you can tell us about like, what is an Ironman? Um, why do you want to do this? And what benefits are you gaining from all this training and discipline? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the half is September 10th. So it's really coming up. I'm super excited. Uh, a full Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and then a marathon. Uh, so my, my cousin was actually the first one that like kind of put it on the map for me. He did a really, really good job. And I ended up meeting several other people that honestly were just inspirations in my life. And I was like, there's some about it that like these people that are achieving are taking on these really big challenges. And another person in my life that I found to be a big uh, example for me had said, seek out discomfort, you know, challenge yourself to do the hard things. And I looked at this and I was like, this seems like it'd be pretty hard. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to get going on it and I started doing the training at first and then I really, really committed to it. Um, and you know, 
when you really kind of got to have that why as to why you're doing something like that and to establish the discipline to get, you know, your strategy going, you know, whether you're going to work with a coach or these different things, but the routine, the discipline, like having to do a five hour like bike and then like get off the bike and run can be a really big challenge. And you hit, you know, like two and a half hours and you're like, what am I doing? And then you just return back to your why. And that's what pushes you forward. So to me, it's not just about like the race. It's about the habits you build and the determination, whether it's a race, your career or anything that's challenging you in your life, you're going to have to have that resilience and be able to have that why to fall back on. Because I really think anything worth doing is going to push you and make you reconsider why you're even doing it. And if it's not, I don't know if you're pushing yourself hard enough. And being able to face those challenges and really understand why you're doing something and push through, I think really leads to a meaningful life. So I, you know, whether it's a marathon or just whatever you want to you know, push yourself in, I've found it to be tremendously uh, beneficial for me. And uh, the last thing I'd say is you realize that, uh, it, you know, there's so many people that want to help you succeed and, and have been there for me. So it's just been a really cool process. And and a lot of people will support you. So it's been a really cool journey. That's great. Well, being a marathon runner, I would agree with everything you said. And I'm sure there's days, I know there's days for me when I don't feel like getting out of bed. I don't feel like doing the 15, 16 mile run. I don't feel like powering through the heat or the rain or the snow. But if you can do that later on in, in your life, you're gonna have days and events that are hard and you'll, you'll have developed that, that spiritual muscle of discipline, of self-mastery that's going to help you. Because human nature doesn't like suffering, right? So if we can kind of let, let ourselves know who's in charge, so when we are challenged by God, by others, by life, we'll have that that fortitude to power through it, like you said. So I, I do admire you for that. And best of luck. I hope the race goes well, you know? Yeah, so, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's it's fun. So Ryan, you, you mentioned earlier that um, you had a, a concussion from a a water skiing accident last winter. Taylor helped you through that. If you could tell us a little bit about that and, and maybe some of the lessons you learned from that, some of the uh, life lessons, spiritual lessons, if you could share that, that'd be great. Absolutely. So it's been, now it's been a year and a half, almost two years. It's been a while. Um, and Father Michael, I just want to say thank you because you were also somebody who was there for me during this, you know, challenging part of my life um i was down in the florida keys doing something called uh, barefoot water skiing so had the great idea to go out there and ski without skis <laughs> so already <laughs> starting off in trouble um but i uh you know we're going 30 almost 40 miles an hour and i went down and i fell in uh in the way i i came down and i fell i, I suffered an injury to my neck and my head and I got a severe concussion and uh, the resulting you know next days weeks months I was pretty limited in my ability to uh, live the life I had been comfortable knowing and understanding I, I took for granted a lot of things in life uh, you know just being able to be in a group of people and you know sit at a restaurant and have all the the noise the light the sound um that was a challenge to me just uh getting out of out of the house because my brain was still recovering from uh the injury and my ability to handle stimulation was um severely challenged i mean even just getting up and walking to the end of the street my balance was off so uh it, it was very challenging that i had to come to this reckoning that at least in the short term, things were going to be different. And a lot of the things that were core to me as a person, um, liking to interact with big groups of people and, and socialize and, you know, my commitment to my profession and, and work and not being able to do that, uh, really humbled me in a lot of ways. And, you know, at a, at a certain point, um, I was in a pretty dark place and, you know, I was praying to, to God for help. I was leaning on my uh, friends and family, Father Michael, we, we had spoken several times and, you know, really 
I found a way to grow stronger in my faith and I'm so grateful for it. Um, I think God answered my prayers. I was very close to even breaking my neck. Um, and that would have been totally different. So, I mean, a couple, a couple lessons, I would say I was able to grow deeper in my faith and my spirituality, which was a blessing coming out of it. Um, and I really, uh, appreciate and learned the importance of gratitude, even for the small things, uh, that we take for granted every day because we're just living, living our lives. And then a deeper appreciation for my close friends, family, and loved ones who are there for me. Um, you know, I've made a, a great recovery and I'm, I'm good to go now, but, uh, they were very, it was a very, very hard time for me for about a year, a year and a half of my life. Mm, that's great. So one, one comment I hear from millennials is just their relationship with their parents. And, you know, there's good points and there's bad points, but what, what advice would you give to all the parents of millennial children in terms of things to avoid, things to foster, things to be aware of, things to be sensitive to? Because I think I remember even being a college kid at Michigan State, you know, when I came home, I love my mom and dad, but especially my mom, I loved her, but sometimes I was still little Michael. I was, you know, and, and I was no longer little Michael. I was now a college kid. So that the transition you guys are going through from being kind of a kid at home to your own person, an adult, but at the same time, you're still children. So, so if you want to maybe break that down and, and, and give some advice to the parents on how they can better connect with the millennial kids and things they need to be sensitive to and aware of, that'd be great. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, one thing I would start with is, you know, having that trust in the relationship, I think is so crucial. I mean, being able to really sit down and understand what's going on in their life, uh, and listen, because maybe you don't understand what they're going through. Maybe they wouldn't understand what you're going through. It's just a different dynamic, a different world. I think that is so fundamental and foundational in having that connection between, you know, a parent and a kid, you know, I'm not a parent now, <laughs> but, um, I feel like that's just like very crucial to start with. Um, and in terms of like the sibling relationship, I'd say, you know, really encouraging your kids to be close with family, you know, a lot of seeing it through my parents with their siblings, but like, that was definitely one of the most foundational things that I really appreciate my parents did for me. And like, I can rely on my siblings, like they're all my best friends. And, you know, I'm always going to want to have that relationship. And I'm so thankful for that relationship. And I think it also strengthened my relationship with my parents because my siblings were so close to me. And so were my parents because of that. So I'd say those are two of the main things that I've found to be like, you know, things I really value with my parents and like developing that relationship. And one last thing, I guess, you know, I, I don't know how to really translate the lesson from this, but I know so many kids are addicted to social media and like the technology and all those things. And I don't know the solution there, but when I ended up going to my boarding school, you know, there was one console for like 50 guys and I used to play video games. And I'm not saying they're the worst thing in the world, but like, I feel like I have so much more time because I don't play them anymore. And you know, when you're trying to split like a console with 50 guys, you're just not going to do it. So I ended up getting out of that. And, you know, I even have uncles that have like asked me for advice on like, how do you get the kids off the video games? You know, I don't know what the solution there is, but like, I would think fostering really good social groups, um, are just like such a good foundation to have, you know, like a good relationship with people, with your parents, with whoever, just so you're not like always on your phone with Instagram or video games or whatever. But like, I really do. I really wanted to mention that because I think that's been so foundational in my social skills and getting to enjoy life because I'm not, you know, just stuck to a screen all the time. I mean, I delete Instagram during the week and I'll only use it on the weekends. But the last thing I'd say is, you know, try not to like force that on your kids. But I guess like I've kind of said in this whole thing is by leading by example, instead of like really pushing at it, just, you know, show how you live and 
they decide to adopt that, great. But I think that's the best you can do. Um, I think that's a lot better than, you know, trying to force it on them and then getting resentment. So those are a little bit of my, my thoughts. Uh, thank you. Brian, yeah. do you have any thoughts on this? I think, I think T, T has it covered. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know, I think it's hard to, you know, I've, I've got thoughts on this. Um, would like to caveat that I am not a parent. So easy for me to give advice. Uh, thank you to all the parents out there that are working hard every day for their kids. Um, you know, we're all really, really fortunate to have, um, moms and dads and grandparents growing up who who look out for us, um, coming from, you know, now I'm 30, but after seeing that transition out of, out of college and being a teenager prior to that, I agree with Taylor. I think, you know, fostering, um, honesty and finding a way to just be straight up with your kids and explain to them, you know, why things are the way they are. Why do you have these views? You know, if it's going to be social media, which I think is going to be the biggest thing that my generation is going to have to tackle with our kids, um, breaking it down, explaining why, not just, Hey, you can't have the phone during these hours. You know, here are the reasons why these are the things you're passionate about. If you have those, you know, if you have the phone during those hours, you're going to be tired and you're not going to feel good. And you're not going to be able to play sports with, with your friends, stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. um, I think one great thing that we could share that our parents did a great job with, um, was family dinners every night and not having the phone at dinner every night. I think that's a great way to end your day. Um, everybody collectively getting together, um, continuing to grow in that relationship and developing it by, you know, something as, as simple and timeless as breaking bread. You sit down, you have dinner and, um, you talk to each other every day and it's making that little effort to sit down for 30 minutes or an hour that I think over time, um, can, can really help in your family life. That's great. Just one, one last question for you guys. And I, I really love working with you guys and our fellowship group and just millennials in general. I think it's a generation that people don't understand. There's a lot of study. There's a lot of, uh, peer research studies on you guys, a lot of statistics, but we don't often hear you. We don't often kind of know what you're thinking, how you're feeling. If you could just tell us, you know, and, and I didn't go through this cause I was in the seminary, but maybe, um, that transition you, you, you went through from like being a student to working in the world and maybe even having your own apartment. And now that transition that you're looking at, which is to eventually get married, that's a whole nother step. Like what are your thoughts on that? What are your, your worries, your fears, your, your, your hopes, your dreams, anything you want to share in that just to give our listeners a little bit of insight into what's in your heart and mind what you went through and what you're experiencing right now in terms of what's ahead. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll start with that one. <laughs> That's a long one. And I think a, like a quote from a coworker really sums it up. I think, you know, he was about like 32 and he told me, you know, in your twenties, especially after, you know, getting out of college, you know, the time is going to pass no matter what. Uh, some people are going to hang around and just hang around with their friends a lot. Some people are going to, you know, do their hobbies. Some people are going to relax. Some people are going to go really, really hard at their career. Uh, you know, everyone's going to have different paths, but he said, make sure to choose your path. And he wasn't like, there's a right path or there's, you know, a wrong path in terms of like what you want to do, but he's like, but this is your time, you know, like you're saying before you eventually get married and these different things, like you have this time to, you know, if you want to go get really into hiking or really into an athletics or do like an Ironman or, you know, whatever it might be, learn a language. But he, you know, really stressed to me to, to make that decision and, and make it your own because the time will fly and then you're going to turn around and, you know, five years has passed. So for a lot of people coming out of college, like where spiritual direction and, and really just reflection in general, I think can be really, really valuable is to set that intention, whether it's deciding who you want to be, what, you know, 
career you want to pursue or, or what opportunities you want to take. It's just having that reflection and really taking some direction and going with it. You know, I really do agree with what he said is that, you know, everyone has their own path, but, you know, it can be really easy to like see things really start to fly by when you're not in this rigid, or excuse me, this, um, it's just a very clear cut path that you've yeah. always been from the next grade to the next, you know, now, you know, you can go whatever career you want or whatever you want to do. So I think that can be overwhelming for a lot of people and to really just focus and have some develop those mentorships, like learn from the people that are doing what you want to do is going to really help you set yourself up on the right path and, uh, and you know, take life the way you want to, see it go. So, so Taylor, any comments on marriage in the next step? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not really ready for the marriage department, so I don't know if I'd be uh, <laughs> very helpful on that front. Classic okay. millennial answer. Yeah. <laughs> a little evasive there, a little evasive, Taylor. That's okay. I, I, I can appreciate that, but at I mean, some point. I guess, I guess the only thing I'd say on the marriage thing is, uh, you know, I'm as a consistently like, you know, dated and started to like learn more about you know people that like you know girlfriend is that the values are so important and like you know i don't want to speak too much on the marriage side because i'm not (laughs) there but like you know you have these superficial things like what kind of music do you like these different things about a relationship but the older i get the more i realize like it's really about having that same value system and a lot of the same beliefs you know especially being the same religion, like really believing and wanting to teach your kids the same thing. Again, I'm not there yet, but like, I think that's so critical to, you know, being able to have a healthy marriage, you know, someday and, and wanting to parent in a similar style. So like, I think finding those things out pretty early on, you know, not like, you know, my first couple of days of things like that, (laughs) before you get really, really involved with someone, it helps you narrow down who you want to be with and you know, if you're going to be a good fit for each other. So, uh, I'd say that's my two cents on the relationship thing. Thank you. Ryan, any comments on on your transition and and your current mindset in terms of your next step entering marriage and fatherhood and all that. So transition wise coming out of college, going into college, especially from military school, was interesting where you have a lot of structure, you have a path like Taylor's talking out of and talking about, and then you're, you, you have ultimate freedom of basically time and schedule. And, you know, it's the first time that you're you're out on your own. It's interesting though, because then you go from college where you have much more limited responsibilities to thinking about your profession and your professional life. So one big thing for me coming out of college was figuring out professionally what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And it was definitely a big area of of focus and passion um, because you have so many options. It's almost like you get lost in all of the options. And I think that was something that was completely top of mind for me leaving college and entering the working world. And I think there was, um, you know, somewhat of a learning curve, but, you know, overall, um, I'm happy to be out of college and working. (laughs) That's a good sign. Um, and you know, I find a lot of meaning in, in my profession and, and the people I've met in my career, which has been, great for me, I would say looking into family, faith, um, you know, having kids and getting married someday, you know, I have a girlfriend and, you know, I, I really care about her. And like Taylor's saying, I think it's important to, you work early in our relationship, but I think it's very important to vet out the values and faith and how you're going to uh, create a family because you're, you're creating that next unit. So the thing I'm thinking about is, um, who's, who's going to be my battle buddy in life and who's going to be, you know, my best friend to go through, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, and how are we going to create a wonderful life for our family in the future? 
So definitely thinking about it. That's great. No, thank you. Well, guys, that was a that was a very thorough interview. I'm very grateful for your time, and I've known you guys for a long time. I almost consider you younger brothers in a way. You know, even though I have you by a few years, right? But uh, but I do. I've always connected with both of you, and you guys mentioned how how much the fellowship has helped you. I think you guys have helped the fellowship a lot too. I know all the guys look up to you. They admire you. They they enjoy they enjoy it when you're there. Um, you bring, you bring a lot to the group. So I just want to thank you for being a part of it and, and thank you and your family for just your example of faith and, and unity and charity and goodness. I think, you know, it's easy to get a little depressed when you look around the world today and I'm trying to bring out families, people to let our listeners know that, you know, there, there, there are plenty of good folks out there who are trying to do the right thing, who are trying to love, who are trying to follow their conscience and do what God wants. And I think you guys are are definitely on that path. So thank you for being on the show. Appreciate it. I'll see you guys uh, at our next meeting. And God bless you. Amen. Okay. God bless you as well. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank okay, you, Father Mike. Looking forward to it. God bless you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Very okay. good. Okay. Thanks. So I'm just going to wrap up the show. And I uh, want to thank both of Taylor and Ryan. Very good to have them on. I personally always learn a lot listening to these guys. They have a lot of insights, a lot of perspectives that we just don't have as adults. I think we almost have to, you know, spend some time listening, like Taylor said, to them. Listen to how they're feeling, listen to how they're reacting, listen to how they're how they see reality. We have to kind of study them. And also, you know, take them where they're at. I think culture today is is different than culture was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's harder to find young men and women who have the value system Taylor and Brian have. You know, it's, it's beautiful to see, but that, that didn't just happen. You know, I think the the family, the education they had, the friends they've had, you know, it's taken a whole a whole bunch of battle buddies, using Ryan's expression, you know, to kind of get these guys through their challenges and their bumps. And I think for the mom and dad that they have, that, that's had a lot to do with it too. Cheryl and Bob love each other. They've been faithful. They go to Mass every Sunday. They really care about their kids. I mean, it's their number one priority. They would do anything for their kids. They would die for their kids. You, you can see that. And and if you invest in your children and you invest in your marriage, you invest in your faith, generally you get pretty good results. There's no perfect millennial, even these two guys. They're good guys, but they're not perfect, you know, but they're pretty good. But that came from a lot of effort, a lot of love, and a lot of sacrifice. I would just say that, you know, I, I remember I, I, I asked, I've asked millennials, what they would like to see from their parents. And a couple of the guys in the group have told me that, that they wish their parents would be more vulnerable with them. They wish their parents would be more real with them and even share kind of their journey of faith when they were in their 20s and 30s to kind of let them know, this is how faith helped me. This is what I went through. This was a struggle I had in my marriage early on. I remember there was a couple in New York City that they were just about to get married and the, the uh, young man's parents came down and had dinner with them in New York City. And they opened up about their 35 years of marriage and told them, this is what we've learned. This is why we would have been different. This, these are the, some of the things we wish we had done early on. These are the things you want to be aware of. And, and the couple, I, I had breakfast with them the next day. They said, you know, it was so beautiful to hear our parents kind of open up about their marriage and tell us what they learned and, and kind of help us prevent making some of the mistakes they made. You know, you don't have to be perfect because life is messy. Marriage is messy. Don't be afraid to talk about it. And I would also say, you know, to have a lot of dependence on the Holy Spirit. I say this to, to, to all the millennials. I say it to Ryan and Taylor. I say it to the parents. You know, we all have the Holy Spirit as our guide, as kind of our, our caddy, our spiritual caddy, our, our counselor. And when it comes to relationships, especially family relationships, in sibling relationships, it can get really dicey. It can get really messy. It can get really complicated because you feel things that much deeper. If there's a problem with a sibling, you really feel it in your heart. If there's a problem with, with your relationship with one of your parents or a parent's relationship with one of her sons or his, his daughters, you feel it deep in your heart. And too often, we, we try to think through it. We try to reason through it. We don't get on our knees and say, God, I need help. God, I need your wisdom. 
God, I need your perspective on this. God, could you help me understand what I need to say? Help me understand what I need to do. You know, I, I, I've, I've told this example. My mom had several siblings, and her oldest sister was a little problematic for the whole family. She was very talented. She was doted upon by the dad. It's a complicated relationship. So everybody struggled with this sister. And for years, you know, this sister had a problem with my mom, in part because she was jealous, because I was a priest. My brother was a deacon. My sister was a saint. She was in a wheelchair. So my mom told me, I remember, she said, you know, Michael, I need to repair this relationship. I'm going to go over to my sister's house. I ask you to pray for me because it's going to be really hard. I'm going to have to apologize for things I don't really feel I'm that sorry about, but I know I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to find a way to make this work. Because she just wasn't at peace because she wasn't okay with her sister. And I think that's a great example. And even, even talking to Cheryl, Ryan, and Taylor's mom, other people have commented, guys, on, on, your, on your relationship as siblings. People notice it. I've noticed it. I mean, you guys have an unusually good relationship, okay? I mean, I have an older brother, and I'm a priest. He's a deacon. So, you know, thankfully, we get along pretty well, right? I just talked to him today. But it's kind of cool that her brother is like your best friend. I've been considered my best friend as my brother, but you got to work at it. It doesn't just happen. But it's such a cool thing because it's so much deeper. It's so much more profound than a friend because it's blood. And it's like you were raised by the same two parents. You went through the same types of things as kids. You were under the same roof, right? You kind of lived everything together. You've been in the trenches together. And I think God kind of created this, this team called the family. And it's sacred. And he wants us to really protect it. And, and, you know, and, and nourish, nourish that. And the last thing I say to parents is, you know, we, we don't talk enough about prayer and sacrifice. I know Taylor talked about Mimi offering up sacrifices when she had cancer, you know, and everybody suffers. There's so many old people that suffer, but don't waste it. Don't waste the suffering. If you have a headache, if you have a health issue, if you have an issue at work that you don't like, or it's just a bad day, it's a rainy day, you didn't sleep well, your back hurts, whatever it is, try to offer that up with a smile. And if you have children, offer it up for them because you're going to gain graces for them. And don't forget to pray for them. You know, my mom told me something. It was the most beautiful thing a mom can tell her son. And I'm, I'm never going to forget it. She said, you know, Michael, I've been going to Mass every day for the past 55 years. And I prayed for you every day during communion. And she looked at me and smiled and she said, I really love you. And I pray for you every day during communion. And more than anything else my mom did for me, I'm so grateful she prayed for me. As I think the prayers are really what have helped me stay the course in my life. Her prayers, you know, parents need to pray for their children. Children need to pray for their parents too. It's not easy to be married 35, 45 years, you know. I mean, it can be hard sometimes. You know, it's not, you don't just coast along. So I think if parents are praying, praying for children, children are praying for parents, you're offering up sacrifices for each other, that gets God involved. And when God's involved, things start happening. Then you got a really beautiful family. You got a really beautiful unit. And then you can evangelize because, I don't know, when I think of evangelizing, I think of a good example. And you guys, the rabbit family is a really good example. I met your grandfather. He's amazing. Harry's amazing. He transmitted, and, and your grandmother must have been amazing, too, from what I understand. Well, you guys got the benefit of that, right? So it's up to you guys to pass the torch. Your, your mom and dad have passed the torch to you. Now you have to pass the torch to your kids. And you both talked about that in marriage. And, and you're building that person that's going to pass the torch right now. That's what it's about, right? Being, being that person that your kids can admire, your grandkids can admire. And it takes a lot of work, a lot of love, and a lot of prayer. So, well, good. We're going to wrap this up with a prayer. It's been a great show, Holy Spirit-driven, and it's always fun having young people on the show. you got to spice it up a little bit, right? So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord, for this radio show tonight. Grateful for all the listeners that have been listening for the show. I ask you to bless all of them. I ask you to bless the Rabbit family to give them peace and strength and perseverance. And fortitude that they can stick it out to the end and that they can be with you in heaven forever we ask all this through christ our lord amen in the, name of the father amen. and the son and the holy spirit amen god bless you too thanks again